Okay, I'm just going to continue on Christmas this morning. Just apologize, not feeling that great. But um, I will go through the story in Luke and in Matthew and just share a couple of things with you that I think might be interesting if you haven't realized them before. Elizabeth's kind of giggling because she saw me preparing the sermon last night. She's wondering how I'm going to use the things that I have in there. All right, so let's read from Luke 1. We'll just start in the Gospel of Luke and just look at um, the story of Jesus' birth. So we're looking at the, the birth of Jesus Christ. Verse 26, Luke 1. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. So you can see where uh, Joseph and Mary start off. They start in their hometown of Nazareth uh, in Galilee. To a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favoured, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. So we see there that Mary was a blessed woman, and we'll uh, just touch on that in a couple of minutes. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. So the salutation being this greeting. So she's saying, you know, she's troubled that she's being visited by this angel, and she's wondering why this angel is visiting her. She casts in her mind, she's thinking about what's the purpose of this meeting. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favour with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and, his, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. <clears throat> then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? So she's saying, How is this possible, because I've never slept with anyone? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. So we see here that John the Baptist, who is uh, the, the son of Elizabeth, is six months younger than Jesus. So they're six months apart. Uh, who is called barren, for with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. So we see that when this happens, when, when Mary is approached by the angel Gabriel, I sort of think of this as Mary's uh, Muhammad moment when uh, she's approached by the angel Gabriel and, and given uh, you know, a, a certain revelation to, in order to be uh, the, the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see that after this happens, Mary then uh, leaves Nazareth to then go into Judah to stay with Elizabeth. Elizabeth is already being six months pregnant and she stays with her for three months. So I think she actually stays uh, with Elizabeth up until she gives birth to uh, uh, John the Baptist. But an interesting thing here is, I just want you to see here um, the attitude of Mary when she's approached by the angel Gabriel. I mean, the angel Gabriel comes to her and says, you know, you're going to bear a son and call his name Jesus and the Holy Ghost is going to overshadow you and you're going to bring forth uh, this, this child who's going to be called the Son of God. <clears throat> and look at what she says in verse 38. Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. So we see here the attitude of Mary when she's, when she's approached by the angel of God and said, this is what you're going to do. There's no resistance. There's no excuses. It's just a lady that says, you know, here I am, Lord. You know, you do, do with me what you will, basically. She says, behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And isn't this the attitude that we should have? You know, when we hear the word of God, when we hear what God wants us to do, this is the sort of attitude we should have. We should have the attitude that just says, behold, here I am. No excuses, no resistance. We should ought to just do what God wants us to do. And, you know, this is probably one of the reasons why uh, Mary was a, a woman of faith and she was blessed to be the Lord's mother because she had this attitude. Now, let's continue verse 39. And Mary rose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah, and entered into the house of Zacharias, and saluted Elizabeth. 
And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, so when Mary greeted Elizabeth, I was like to salute somebody, say hello. The babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. So again, Elizabeth feel, being filled with the Holy Ghost is saying that you know, Mary is a blessed woman. And whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Now, now notice this. It says, And blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. Now, you know, the Catholics really love the fact that, uh, you know, the Bible says that Mary is a blessed woman and they try and exalt her to something higher than uh, just a regular woman. But we see here in verse... Uh, <coughs> verse 45 why was mary blessed was she blessed because she was more holy than other women was she blessed because she was a she was more righteous than other women no right she was blessed because she believed you know because she believed that's why she had that attitude of hey god do what we do with me what you will um, but we see here that as elizabeth is speaking through the holy ghost uh, and being filled with the holy ghost she says here that mary was blessed because she believed and blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. So she was blessed because of her faith, not because of her righteousness. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Saviour. So we see here that Mary also had sin. Mary was a sinner just like us, and this is why she required a Saviour. She recognized that the child that was going to be born of her was to be her God and her Saviour. My spirit hath rejoiced in God my Saviour, for he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. And we do. But now we realize that she was blessed because of her faith, not because of her works. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation <coughs> to generation. He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He hath filled the hungry with good things and the rich he hath sent empty away. He hath hope in his servant Israel. So hope in his past tense of helped. He hath hope in his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. And he spake to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. So, you see here that like when Mary is praising God, she's giving all glory to God, isn't she? She's not giving glory to herself. She's not asking people to pray to her. She's not asking people to glorify her, to pray to her and make statues of her and bow down before her. I mean, we see Mary was a, a woman of faith and she pointed people to God. She praised God. So obviously uh, what the Catholics are doing is, is incorrect and is wrong. <coughs> now look at verse 57. Now Elizabeth's full time came that she should be delivered and she brought forth a son. And her neighbours and her cousins heard how the Lord had showed great mercy upon her, and they rejoiced with her. And we, we won't read that part, but then we read on about the birth of John the Baptist and how he was named John, uh, and how Zacharias was you know, made mute, and then he, um, he got his voice back after the baby was born. So Mary abode, we see there in verse 36, she stayed with Elizabeth for three months and then returned to her own house. So if you remember, she's approached by the angel Gabriel. She says, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord. And then she goes to stay with Elizabeth. Elizabeth is six months pregnant. And then she stays with Elizabeth three months. So I'm guessing that she stayed with Elizabeth up to the birth and maybe helped Elizabeth out through the birth. So a good friend um, there. All right, let's, uh, let's go to Luke 2. So we'll, just, we'll skip uh, the rest of that chapter because it's more about John the Baptist. And we'll go to verse two, uh, chapter 2. <clears throat> chapter 2 Luke and it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed so uh, nothing changed there even in the days of Jesus Christ governments are still um, taxing people and, and, and taking our money and this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria and all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, 
to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. It's a couple of things I just wanted to point out here. I just wanted to show you some, some photos. But um, number one is, you know, it seems like it, even from the time of Jesus Christ, governments have been inconveniencing people. You know, like even now, you know, they tell us what we can eat. They tell us what we can drink. They poison our water. They try and force vaccinations on us. And it just seems like not, there's nothing new under the sun. Even from the time of Jesus Christ, governments have been inconveniencing their citizens and, and, and making them do things that they, they wouldn't otherwise do. I mean, you know, do you think it was convenient for, for um, Mary and Joseph to have to move all the way back down to Bethlehem just to pay their taxes? I mean, why, why, why couldn't they just pay their taxes in Nazareth? You know, they have to make it like, the hardest for them, get them to move all the way down to, to, to Judea and to Bethlehem uh, just to be taxed. Uh, the other thing is, you know, <coughs> when they moved to, um, uh, to uh, uh, Judea in Bethlehem, I believe they actually moved. So I didn't think they actually just went there just to pay their taxes and then went back to Nazareth. I think they actually moved. And the reason is, if you actually see how far uh, Nazareth is from Bethlehem. I was just looking this up on Google Maps. I don't know if uh, you know, the towns are the exact same location as they, they were in the first century. But you can see Nazareth is all the way at the top. And you can see Jerusalem, which is the capital city of Israel, um, at the bottom there. And Bethlehem is just below Jerusalem. So if you, on Google Maps, if you just say, you know, I'm going to walk from Nazareth to Bethlehem, because obviously they didn't have a car back then. They might have had their camels or their horses or whatever they had in order to, to move from Nazareth to Bethlehem. It's a 34-hour walk, 163 kilometers. And that's if you take that path. I'm guessing maybe the, the road that goes this way maybe is not walkable. I don't know why Google Maps has taken me that way. So 163 kilometers. To give, to give you a perspective of how far that is, this is a map from, let me just zoom out a bit. This is a map from Sydney to Newcastle. All right, and that's 143 kilometers. If you took this route, and this route includes a ferry, if you take this route, what's that, 164 kilometers. So walking from Nazareth to Bethlehem is like walking from here to Newcastle. I don't know if anyone's like dri driven to Newcastle. It takes a while to get to Newcastle. I don't think anyone would walk that distance um, in, in nowadays. So you can see that when they, when they went to Bethlehem to be taxed, I believe they actually moved there. So they'd have to pick up every, because it's not like Joseph's just gonna walk, you know, 163 kilometers, pay his taxes and then walk back, you know, because you're gonna have to prepare for the journey and all that sort of stuff. So I, I believe that they actually moved down to, um, to Bethlehem in order to pay those taxes and that's where they were staying and that's why they were able to go to the temple. So very far, it's probably not something they would just go to pay their taxes and then go back home. They would have had to prepare for that journey um, <clears throat> and you know, take their belongings and ta take enough uh, uh, provisions in order to uh, last them that, that trip. Now, the other thing I just wanted to show you here was um, not so much anything to do with the passage, but when I read here uh, in, in verse 5, it says here, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And, um, you know, when I read this passage, it just reminds me of my own personal experience with Elizabeth. <laughs> when we left, um, you know, Phoenix, Arizona, Faithful Word Baptist Church, and then went to Mexico. She was pregnant with, with, um, with Simon at the time. And, and we actually moved there. It was due to governments as well, you know, to, in order to get her papers, to get her to Australia. And, and while we were there, she was great with child and the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. I just wanted to show you some photos just because um, I, nev I never actually shared this with you. And, you know, a lot of you guys have not seen these photos. So I just thought I'd just spend a couple of minutes to just show you some photos from us. Mm. In Mexico, so this was the this was the last day that we were at Faithful Word Baptist Church, and we're just taking a picture with um, Stephen Anderson there. <coughs> um, I'll just I'll just let it load. 
So yeah, when I, when I read that story, it just reminds us of, of our experience. But this is our, our last day at Faithful Word. And then this is Stephen Anderson just giving us uh, directions on how to drive into, into Mexico. We're heading to a city called Monterrey. Nuevo Leon was the state. Uh, here's Elizabeth with her reluctant family just <laughs> sending her off. And you know, not so happy that she was leaving the country and leaving with somebody that she'd only known for a couple of months. Um, and, and starting a family. And this is when we reached the border and uh, we, we weren't able to just sneak out, you know, unnoticed. So they asked Elizabeth whether she, whether she was a citizen and obviously she was not. So they pulled us out of the car, they searched our car, we took everything out. There's Chris Broughton just, you know, showing how pleased he is with government authorities. Now it turned out that we couldn't go all the way in with our friends um, just because they didn't have passports and um, the, author the Mexican authorities were turning them back. So we had to send them back to the United States with the hired car that we had, which was that white, um, I can't remember what it was, but that white sedan. And we basically went to this place where you catch a coach into Monterey Nuevo Leon. And this is the picture we took uh, when we parted ways. So the, the boys, Scott and, and Chris, helped us to pack all our things out of the car. Um, and, and we put all that into a coach and that's where we departed our ways. And I remember Chris's departing words when he saw me into the coach. He said, Victor, you're a braver man than I am. <laughs> but you can see that's all we had. You know, so when we packed our stuff, that, that, that little pile of stuff there was everything we owned. Um, we went into, into Monterey, um, Nova Leon, and we had no idea where we were going. We'd never been there before. Uh, we got there, it was a beautiful city. You can see there that that's not me taking a picture on, a, on an angle. That, that's actually how, uh, how mountainous Monterey is. So the, the word Monterey actually uh, it, it stands for mountains. So the, the city of Monterey is actually a city that's between two mountain ranges. So these two mountain ranges and the city is in the valley and get, gets built up on either side of these two mountain ranges. It's actually pretty cool. So it's a pretty beautiful view. This is actually walking distance from where we were living. And if you just walk up the hill, you can look over and you can see the, the mountain ranges on either side. Now this is our bed. So somebody gave us a mattress and this is our first place that we stayed in uh, when we were in Mexico. Uh, not a pleasant, it's a hard concrete, cold floor. Uh, you know, after we put a few sheets on there and, and the sheets we had in our, in our belongings, that's what it looked like. So we didn't have much when we went there, but uh, you don't need much. We were happy, you know, and we... Uh, we, we we started off with humble beginnings and, and now we can look back and, and it's an experience that we um, wouldn't like to go through again, but something that was um, you know, definitely memorable. <coughs> so, so we went into Mexico and then this is uh, Monterey. This was the view from the top of our place where we were staying. So you can see it just from, from uh, just going onto the roof, you can look out and you can see the mountain ranges on either side. Now, I saw what, what it sort of reminded me of and what I wanted to show you these photos of. You know, you know it says, you know, they, they went all the way to Bethlehem and she was great with child. Because when we were in Mexico, Elizabeth was pregnant and because we didn't have a car, we didn't know where we were going, man, we walked all over Mexico, all over Monterey, just trying to get like her paperwork, trying to get her passport, get her, get her birth certificate, get it translated. And because she wasn't from Monterey and I wasn't from Mexico, we had no idea where all these buildings were. So we had to find this government building and that government building and go all over, going to all these government buildings, um, trying to, to, to find our paperwork. So this is us at the train station. I have no idea what this guy is doing. Like, why has he got this in the back of his, back of his shirt? Is he like, maybe he just, <laughs> I only just realized that when I was like putting this photo up. He's got his folders there. Maybe he just doesn't want to carry them. And that's, is that something Mexicans do? Oh, that is something Mexicans do. <laughs> they put their documents in the back so they don't have to carry them. I thought maybe it was supporting his back or something like that. Uh, this is another government building. You can see governments, they spare no expense, right, with their government buildings. They make them all fancy. See that big bucket of water? So I don't know how much that costs, but it costs a lot. It's a mall. So we're walking all over Mexico, doing a bit of shopping, you know, trying to find all the different... Uh, places in order to get Elizabeth's paperwork and you can see she's pregnant. She, I think she's about four or five months pregnant. This is more government buildings. You can see governments are spending money wisely on these big animal statues. Uh, some, some waterfalls and some more government buildings. Now when we were in, when we were in Mexico, I was trying to sh show you a couple of these pictures. When we were in Mexico, in order to make ends meet, we, we sold uh, 
uh, chips. We sold chips in the marketplace for just 15 pesos a, a bucket. Now, a peso is about, you know, I think one peso is about 10 cents Australian. So, you know, it's not $15, it's, it's about $1.50 <coughs> a pack. So Elizabeth would help, you know, even though she was pregnant, she would help, you know, peel the potatoes and help cook the potatoes and um, pack the potatoes. And she would even um, help pack the cart and, and help push it up the road. I just wanted to show you this video. <laughs> so Elizabeth being great with child. Because remember that the... Uh, the, the if you remember the, uh, the, um, the terrain of Monterey, it was mountainous, right? So we were living in the valley. So she's actually pushing this up a hill that's really steep. <laughs> Having a bit of trouble there. <laughs> but I just joke, obviously. I, I pushed it up actually most of the way, so that was me pushing it up all the way. And I, I just thought I'd throw in a couple of these photos just so you can get an idea of the sort of um, um, what's the word? What am I looking for? Environment. Environment of what the place looked like where we were staying. So this was the walk up from where we lived up the mountain to the street markets where we would set up and, and, and sell these chips. So we'd push it up just to give you an idea of what the place looked like. There were some flat bits and some bits that were going downhill and that's what I would jump on and actually ride this tricycle. So this is, this tri these tricycles, are, I don't know if they have them here, but there's two wheels at the front and there's sort of like a carriage where you can shove things on and uh, a lot of people will use these to, to go around and sell corn on the corners and things like that. They'd deck them out. So most, a lot of people get these just because they're cheaper than cars and, and, and <coughs> you know, fuel is quite expensive in, in Monterey. So you can see here how close the mountains are on either side. You can just see them. You can actually just walk up. <coughs> so it was um, pretty nice. So this is us getting to the markets now. There's people setting up on this street. And see, that's how far we were walking up. So we'll probably maybe... Three or four, four blocks down is where we lived. And that's where we would set up. We'd set up next to this clothing store, these guys here. And that's what the store looked like when it was all set up. Alrighty, so um, anyways, that's a bit of a segue. I thought that would make things a bit interesting. But, you know, so when it comes to this story, when I read that they went down to um, Bethlehem and they travelled this distance, and, uh, and, and, and Mary was great with child. It just reminds me of my experience with governments and our experience going into Mexico. Now let's continue. Uh, Luke 2, verse 8. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. You know, I noticed recently that some people were posting on Facebook this verse, and, and I didn't realize that the other versions of the Bibles, other, other translations and these corrupt translations of the Bible actually changed this verse to uh, goodwill towards those that please God. Whereas, uh, you know, obviously Jesus Christ was a gift given to all men by the grace of God. Um, so the goodwill is toward all men, not just to those that please God. Um, but how they've butchered such a famous and beautiful verse. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven. So just note that, that after um, they came down and there was a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying glory to God in the highest, on earth peace, goodwill towards men, they went back to heaven. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. 
And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning the child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen. And it was told as it was told unto them. So there we, we read the famous story of the shepherds. They're in the field keeping over their, uh, their flocks by night. And the angel uh, comes to them and says, you know, you'll find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And the thing I just want to mention here about the shepherds is, is, you know, the shepherds had to act on what they heard in order to get that blessing, didn't they? I mean, imagine if the angels, uh, they, they, they saw the vision, right? They saw the angels, they saw the heavenly host, and they just said, hey, that's great. That, there's a, city, there's a saviour born in the city of David, right? They would have missed out on the blessing of seeing Jesus. So the fact that, that they heard the word, right? They heard what was happening and they acted on it in order to get that blessing and see Jesus. And this is how we should be, right? When we hear the word of God, when we hear that, you know, we should be in church, we should be soul winning, we should read our Bible. If we just hear it, if we're just a hearer of the word and not a doer, we're not going to get that blessing that God intended for us if we rather would hear the word and act on it. And what did the shepherds get to, do, get to see when they, when they heard the word and they acted on it? They, get, they, get, they got to saw, they got to see the Lord Jesus Christ, didn't they? Um, now, what was the reaction? You know, once they had seen the Lord Jesus Christ, it says here in uh, <coughs> verse 17, and when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. You see, when you see the Lord Jesus Christ, it's hard to not tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, is it possible for people not to do that? Of course. You know, Spurgeon has a, a famous quote that I think is false that says, you know, if you have no desire for others to be saved, you are not saved yourself. Be sure of that. Now, that's false. Because as a saved person, you can have no desire for people to get saved because you still have the flesh. You can still uh, not care and be unloving. You can, it's possible to hate your brother. It's possible to not have love for people. But is that the reaction we should have? And, you know, I think if a person truly sees Jesus and understands what the Bible is teaching about heaven and hell, what the Bible is teaching about salvation, I think it would be difficult to keep that to yourself and keep the good news to yourself. And that was the response of the shepherds. So it's an example that we can see and we ought to follow in verse 17 that says, when they, heard, they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. So don't keep the good news of salvation to yourself. You know, if you know what it takes to be saved, hey, get out there and tell other people about the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, <clears throat> and you know, I think the more time you spend, you know, pondering on the Lord Jesus Christ and pondering on salvation, you'll grow a desire to want to tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, if you don't have that desire to tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, maybe it's because you're not spending enough time looking at Jesus, right? Looking at Jesus in his word. You're not spending enough time uh, with Jesus' body here. And you're not spending enough time thinking about what Jesus wants you to do. Because I think if you would, you would be more compelled uh, to win souls. Um, you know, you need to turn your heart into good ground. So there's a couple of things on the shepherd. So let's continue. Let's go to Luke uh, 2, verse 21. <coughs> and when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel, which, uh, so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man, uh, behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, to light, a light to lighten the Gentiles 
and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thy thy own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And I won't continue to read this, but we see here the two um, witnesses. Um, We see uh, Simeon and Anna. And then I'll just read this last verse in verse 39. And when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own city of Nazareth. So we see here, you know, them fulfilling the law of circumcision, circumcising Jesus on the eighth day. And we read that, I won't turn to these verses, but we read that in Genesis 17 when it was given to Abraham. And if you want to read later in Leviticus 12, we read about the law of purification after a woman gives birth, whether it's a male or a female, there are certain days she had to wait. And then after her, the days of her purification, she would go to the temple to present the baby and then to offer a sacrifice, you know, um, uh, <coughs> in order to offer a sacrifice for that, for that child. And that's what we see Mary here doing uh, to, uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you remember, they moved from Nazareth down to uh, Bethlehem. And you can see that Jerusalem is actually very close to Bethlehem. So they would travel down to, what, Jerusalem uh, once a year, we we read um, in another chapter of the Bible. So it's actually not too far for them to travel in order to go to Jerusalem to the temple in order to fulfill those things. And then we read in verse 39 that after they had fulfilled these things, they returned into Galilee, Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. Now let's go to Matthew 1 and just compare these, this story, what we read in Luke 2, to what we read in Matthew 1. In Matthew's Gospels. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Now if you remember what we read back in Luke uh, 1 and 2, Probably what happened there is, remember that she went, she was approached by the angel Gabriel, she went to see Elizabeth, stayed there for three months, and then she returned back to Nazareth. So probably when she's returned back to Nazareth, it's three months later, right, after the the angel had said that she was going to give birth to the Lord Jesus. So she's probably got a little bump now, the three-month bump. And this is when Joseph realizes, hey, you know, like we haven't slept together, you know, we're just a spouse, and you're pregnant with, with the baby. What were you doing you know, in, in, in Bethlehem, oh sorry, in, in, um, in Judah, when you were staying with Elizabeth. She was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. So Joseph thought about actually divorcing Mary because he had found some uncleanness in her. Verse 20. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. So we see here that Mary did not remain a perpetual virgin, because he says here that Joseph knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, meaning that they did know each other after she had brought forth her firstborn son. So a lot of Catholics will believe that Mary continued to be a virgin even after she gave birth to the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's not true. And we also read in the Gospels that Jesus had half-brothers. Remember Jude. Paul said he met, saw Jude and Peter in, in Jerusalem and he, and he met Jude, the Lord's brother. <coughs> um, or was it James the, Lord brother? James the Lord's brother? I can't remember. One of those. Um, <coughs> now the other thing here is I wanted to just uh, show you here. Now this is uh, Joseph's encounter with an angel. So Joseph is now in, has encountered an angel in a vision this time. And the angel has said to him, hey, don't fear to take Mary, your wife, because what's conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And I want you to see here in verse 24, he says here, then Joseph being raised from sleep, 
So he's actually got this vision in a, in a dream while he's sleeping. He wakes up, he says, Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife. Now look, this attitude of Joseph was the same attitude as Mary, wasn't it? So we see here that when Mary was approached by the angel, behold, the handmaid of the Lord. Joseph is approached by an angel of the Lord, and as soon as he wakes up, from, he, he doesn't wait a couple of days, he doesn't wait a couple of months, he wakes up from sleep and he does what the angel of the Lord tells him to do. Now do you wonder, this is, might be why this couple was chosen to bear the, 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 the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, this, this was a couple, not just Mary was a woman of faith, but Joseph, the Bible says, was a just man. But it seems that he also was a man of faith because when he were heard the word of God, he acted on it straight away as well. All right, let's continue. Chapter 2. <clears throat> now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, <clears throat> behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and I come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea. For thus it is written uh, by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called, the wise men inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. So Herod is reigning in, in Jerusalem. So if you remember, Jerusalem is very close to Bethlehem. And they know the prophets because it's, it's told, I can't remember what book, that Jesus was going to be born in Bethlehem. So he calls, you know, the wise men and he calls all these people and says, where is he going to be born? He's going to be born in Bethlehem. So they send, he sends them down to, <clears throat> to Bethlehem. And he's uh, obviously pretending here to, to worship him because he wants to uh, kill the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> now, where did we stop? Okay, verse 8. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. <clears throat> and when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and arose uh, and departed into Egypt and was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wrath, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and in all the coasts thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are not. But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeareth in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. And he arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. But when he had heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither, notwithstanding being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. So this is an interesting story. A couple of things I just want to point out to you here. Man, you see, isn't Joseph just a man of dreams and visions? I mean, he's constantly getting a vision, he's constantly getting a dream, and to tell him what to do and where to go. But um, look here when... Uh, uh, Look at this, and when he gets this, I just want to show you again just the faith of Joseph. 
It says here, when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Look at this. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. So there's no hesitation here again of what Joseph is doing. He gets this vision from the angel, and as soon as he wakes up, the day has not even broken. It's night. He packs up his goods. He packs up his family, and he departs into Egypt. Now, let's just go back to that map. If you want to know, let's just add a, add a destination here. Let's go Cairo, Egypt. Now, if you want to see how far Egypt is from where they were staying in Bethlehem, I mean, they've we know roughly how far Nazareth is from Bethlehem. So now he gets this vision and he's told, hey, you know, take your family and go flee into Egypt. And he doesn't even think twice about the journey that he's about to take. He packs his family, they go by night, and they travel. Well, this whole thing is about 600K, so about 400 kilometers. And he takes his family into Egypt. This is a man of faith. I don't think we hear a lot about Joseph and, and the sort of man that he was, but this is the sort of man that he that he was, and he's a, he's a great man of faith. <clears throat> so um, I thought that was interesting. Um, just about the wise men as well. So the wise men came from uh, the east to Jerusalem, didn't they? And they were following this star. Now, the star was leading them to the Lord Jesus Christ. So, you know, yes, I think people, when they follow the light, that God has given them, right? It'll eventually lead them to salvation. It'll eventually lead them to the Lord Jesus Christ. But the light itself, the star itself, was not the Lord Jesus Christ. And you have, prof, you know, you have false prophets like Billy Graham saying, "Well, you know, if you if they follow the Muslims, follow the light they have, and you know, these these this religion follows the light that they have. I believe they'll all be saved. I believe they're they're all in heaven." No, Billy Graham is wrong because you know the light is not the Lord Jesus Christ. The light may lead them to the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's the Lord Jesus Christ that will save them. Now, I wanted you to note here as well, is these wise men that come from the East, we're not told how many wise men there are. You know, we sing this hymn, you know, we three kings of Orient are bearing gifts, we, we travel afar. I mean, there's two things that are wrong with this song. This is why I, I personally don't think it's a good song to sing, unless you want to change that first verse to we wise men of Orient are. But uh, number one is they're not kings, you know, they, they were wise men. And number two, we're not told how many there are. You know, I guess people believe that there were three wise men because of the three gifts, gold, frankincense, and, and myrrh. But these were, not, uh, these were not kings, these were wise men. And I think, um, you know, when we look, we'll look at a couple of verses in the Bible just quickly. <clears throat> well, we see here in Genesis 41 that, uh, let's read here in verse 8, it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled. This is where Pharaoh received this dream. And he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt, and look, and all the wise men thereof. And Pharaoh told them his dream, but there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. So we see Pharaoh there is the king of Egypt, but then he has his wise men. So the wise men uh, weren't kings. Again, I uh, just want to show you this verse in Daniel. We see the wise men of Babylon. It says, The king cried aloud, to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans and the soothsayers. And the king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof, shall be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. So not only uh, you know, are these wise men uh, not kings, we're not told uh, how many there are. <clears throat> And the last thing I just wanted to show you about uh, these wise men. So they follow the star, verse 10. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And look at this. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. Now, where was Jesus Christ born? He was born in a stable, wasn't he? But is this where the wise men met Jesus Christ? No, he was in the house. And I just wanted to point this out because I don't know if you guys realize, but you know that the, the, nativ the, the, the nativity scene that you normally see? You know you normally see the wise men and you see the shepherds and they're all in the stable worshipping Jesus? Well, is that right? 
Is that, a, is that actually biblical? It's not, hey. Because what actually happened was the shepherds, they were given the vision and they saw the Lord Jesus Christ in the manger. But when the wise men came, Mary and Joseph had already moved into a house and they had come to worship the Lord Jesus Christ in a house. So they were not actually there at the same time. So these nativity scenes that you see with the wise men and the shepherds are actually false. And this is why, you know, I don't like these, these things like these because it promotes false doctrine. It promotes a scene that is not actually, not actually true. So they did not actually worship Jesus in the stable. They came to Jesus when he was in a house. So what maybe happened, right? They moved from Nazareth down to, um, to Jerusalem. Uh, sorry, down to, to, to Bethlehem. And then they gave birth. There was no room for them in the inn, so then they, they gave birth in the stable. Then we hear about the shepherds, right? The shepherds come and they, they, the, the angels tell them, hey, you'll find the babe wrapped in, wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Then the shepherds come and worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I think probably what happened next, they're staying in Bethlehem, right? They've now moved into a house. They're not going to stay in that stable for, for, for weeks and weeks and end. And I, I believe the timeline is, you know, they're staying in this house, the days of her purification come to pass. They then take Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem and they fulfill those things. That There's the two temple witnesses. They, you know, they circumcise Jesus on the eighth day. They take him to the temple. They fulfill all those things. They go back to their house in Bethlehem. And this is when Herod now sends the wise men to Bethlehem. Right? So they've heard about the birth, the birth of Jesus. They see the star. They're coming from the east. They go to Jerusalem. They're sent down to Bethlehem. And now they're coming and they see Jesus with his mother in the house. And they fall down and they worship him. Now it says here further on, because remember when we read in Luke, um, if we, I'll just go back there quickly. And see. It just says here that after they had performed all those things according to the law, verse 39 of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. Now, if you just read the Luke account of the, of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, you would think, okay, after they went to the temple, you know, they, they were probably staying in, in Bethlehem. They went to Jerusalem, the temple, and did the things according to the law. And then after they did that, they went straight back to Nazareth. That's probably what you would think. But, you know, this is why we have the book of Matthew to show us a couple of different things. We actually learn what actually happened in that verse between when they presented Jesus to the temple and they returned to Nazareth. We hear about them having to flee into Egypt to flee from the persecution of Herod trying to kill the baby Jesus. Um, he says here, when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. <clears throat> so after... Those, after the, uh, they're back in the house, this is how I sort of picture the timeline. They're in the house, the, the wise men come to the house and worship Jesus. After they leave, right, they go another way because they're warned by Herod in a dream. Joseph is also warned. Hey, Herod is going to uh, come and seek the child's life. So at, immediately he gets up in the night and he flees into Egypt. So he actually, they stay in Egypt until the death of Herod. But remember it says here in, in the Gospel of Matthew, in verse 20, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. So we don't know how long they stayed in Egypt, um, but after King Herod is dead, then they, he, he gets another vision and says, Hey, go back into the land of Israel. And he arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. And when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of, father, of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither. Notwithstanding being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee and he came and dwelt in the city, in a city called Nazareth. So it's interesting that we actually find out why they returned from Bethlehem to Nazareth. Because remember, I believe they actually planned to move to Bethlehem. And this is why when they go from Egypt, they're, they're wanting to go back into Bethlehem, right? Because if they're originally from Nazareth, when they flee into Egypt, why wouldn't they just go straight back to Nazareth. I believe it's because when they made the journey to be taxed, they actually moved their family down there. But when they moved their family down there, they had to flee into Egypt. They were wanting to go back, maybe, maybe, or maybe they weren't moving back. Maybe they were just going back to get their stuff. I don't know, because remember, they, they, they rose up by night. They were planning on going back into Bethlehem, but they were warned of God in a dream because the son of Herod was still reigning in Jerusalem. And then instead of going back to Bethlehem, 
they went in, into the side parts and they went back up to Nazareth. So this is how you can fit these two stories together, I believe. So that's, that's how it works. So they flee into Egypt. They, they didn't want to go back, so then they went back up to Nazareth. And so I believe what we read in Matthew is actually why they went back to Nazareth at the end of that story in Luke there. <sighs> Sorry, I'm jumping all around in my notes. Um, okay, maybe I'll just end on this then. <clears throat> So now that we know what we know, right, of, of the story of Jesus Christ and, and how it all turned out and the, and the facts from the Bible and the truth, let's take a test. See what you've learned. The, the nativity scene test. All right, we're going to look at a couple of nativity scenes and you're going to tell me whether it's right or it's wrong according to what we've learned in the Bible. All right? All right, nativity scene set test. What do we see here? False, right? Why? Because we've got some shepherds and we've got the wise men in the stable. So this is actually not a true picture of what has happened in the Bible because they're not all together. Yeah, so this is wrong. Good. All right, right or wrong? False. Again, same one. Because we've got the shepherds and the wise men um, in the same scene. All right, what if, false again, right? Because we've got the wise men. Is this meant to be the shepherd? I mean, he's, he's so young. I don't see how a, little, a boy this young is, is looking after shepherd. Maybe, maybe they are. He looks like he's like four years old. <laughs> so wrong. All right, what about this one? False again, right? Because we've got the shepherds and we've got the wise men. Why else is this one false? Who, can, who else can tell me something that's wrong with this picture? And it was wrong with a couple of the other pictures too. The there angels. Are, there are islands in the background as well. Islands. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. There's, there's angels in this picture. Now remember what happened with the shepherds when the angels came and they sang glory to God in the highest, right? What happened? They went back to heaven. So they're not part of the nativity scene. You know, so no angels, no wise men, just the shepherds, Joseph, Mary and Jesus. Wrong. All right, what's wrong with this picture? Wise men are there. Remember, they're not kings, are they? They're wise men. So they shouldn't be having these crowns because they're not three kings from the east. Again, wrong. This one's a bit Catholic, you see, so you can see a nun. So these are the best pictures I could find. Now, what about this one? So I was a bit, I, I, you know, I didn't know whether this one was right or wrong because I thought, you know, are those three guys the three kings or is this just a group of shepherds? I don't know. Yeah, it could, it could be shepherds, right? Because I don't see any, I don't see them dressed to stuff with wise men. They don't have any gifts. They could be all the shepherds. So this is actually one that's probably a bit more accurate, right? The shepherds have come to see the Lord Jesus with Joseph and, and Mary there. So we'll give, we'll give that one a tick. That one's not too bad. What about this one? No wise men? Only shepherds? So that one's not too bad. So we'll give that one a tick. <laughs> Does he? <laughs> yeah, just ignore, ignore the long-haired men and, and the blonde Jesus. <laughs> so, we, just, uh, we just assume that, that, we're just ignoring that one for a second. See, this is from a, it's from a cartoon that I found. And it was actually, you know, there was this cartoon of uh, the birth of Jesus Christ. But the Bible version was the contemporary English version. But they actually had it right. Uh, when, they, when they told the story of the Lord Jesus Christ, they took it from Matthew and they took it from Luke and they had just the shepherds coming to the manger and then they had actually the, the, the wise men coming and they only had two of them. So they, I think they made it a point to not have three. There was only two wise men and then they bowed down and worshipped Jesus in a house, uh, not in the stable. So that one's right. All right, what about this one? We see Joseph and Mary and we see the, the wise men. <coughs> right or wrong? Why is it wrong, Kevin? Oh. Right, yeah. I thought I'd try and trick you guys. Wrong, because they're not inside the house. Okay, so not inside the house. They, they were in the house when they worshipped the Lord Jesus. So be careful. What about that one? Wise men, that one's right. <coughs> Wise men in the house. All good. Did you, 
So <coughs> that, that was the nativity scene test. I hope that was interesting. But um, did you know that there was one other nativity scene in the Bible? Have you guys ever heard of the other, the alternative nativity scene in the Bible? Mike already knows this. So. <coughs> There's one other nativity scene in the Bible that I don't know if you guys know about. But it, we find it in Revelation 12. Revelation 12. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up, to, caught up unto God and to his throne. Now I would like somebody to depict this on a Christmas day once, this nativity scene. Now if this, if this was turned into a nativity scene, maybe this nativity scene would look a bit like this. Look <laughs> at these pictures. So you see a woman clothed with the sun, the crown of 12 stars on her head, the moon under her feet, and the dragon with uh, seven heads and ten horns. And he's always got the stars around his tail, drawing them to the earth. So it might look like that. It might look like this. It might look like that. It might look like this. I think this one's the coolest out of all the four pictures. I was trying to find some cool pictures of like uh, this nativity scene. So it looks like there she's travailing with birth on the moon. She's clothed with the sun. And then the tail is drawing uh, the stars from heaven <coughs> to the earth. But you know what's missing here? It's, it's missing the child with the rod of iron. <laughs> so I don't know if anyone has any artistic skills. You know, we can draw up. You know, Christine, maybe draw up a nativity scene that looks like this. With the, I, I saw some other pictures as well where there's Michael and the archangel. He talks about the war in heaven. But this is another nativity scene that a lot of people don't really hear much about. Anyways, I hope that was interesting to you and something about a bit different to what you've normally heard from the stories from Luke and Mark, uh, Luke and Matthew. Um, it's always good to, to learn what is biblical because remember we want to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. So if you're going to put a nativity scene together, or if you're going to put a play together, hey, let's make it biblical. Let's not continue to perpetuate false doctrine and comp to continue to perpetuate false images of what is actually in the Bible. Amen. All right, let's pray.